So the senses of the dog, um, I've not put them in any particular order apart from smell. I've put smell first because it is unique as far as a dog's concerned. It's something that is so important to all of us, but particularly to dogs. A dog is a creature of the nose, um, Alexander Horowitz says, in inside of a dog. So dog's sense of smell is up to 100,000 times better than ours. We have about 6 million receptor cells in the nose. Dogs have up to 300 million, depending on breed. Scent is the fastest route by which information travels to the brain. I'll just make sure the mics are all off. Some dogs can smell dead bodies underwater where termites are hiding and natural gas buried under 40 feet of dirt. They can even detect cancer before it's at a stage of being medically diagnosable and can detect lung cancer by sniffing a person's breath. They can sense low and high blood sugar levels in diabetics. They can detect bombs, drugs, termites, bed bugs, accelerants and much, much more. And dogs can be trained to detect epileptic seizures. So the power of the nose, when a dog sniffs, the scent odors travel up to the receptor cells in the nose. You'll notice that dogs' noses quiver when they're sniffing, and that's to expel the air already in the nose to make way for the incoming scent molecules. So they're kind of drawing air and scent molecules in and expelling air at the same time. The tissue inside the nose is coated with receptor sites and hairs within the receptor sites catch and trap molecules of specific types of scent. So there's different types of hairs for different types of molecules. The vomeronasal organ sits above the roof of the mouth along the nasal floor. This detects pheromones and keeps the nose moist so that scent molecules stick to the nose surface. They then dissolve and travel to the vomeronasal organ. Dogs used for scent work may swap activity between the nose and the vomeronasal organs, keep the scent fresh. This is something that we did have a discussion about the other day on the Facebook group where Theo had written a beautiful pause for thought about scent and um, the vomeronasal organ a while ago. Each nose print is unique. Just like our fingerprints, no two dog noses are the same. And it's quite fascinating. You know, if, you, if you're with more than one dog and you look at them, you can actually see the differences. Just like when we look at our fingerprints, you can see how the walls are slightly different in all of us. And Theo had this posted, and I loved it. Dog noses look like angry aliens. They do look very strange from that angle. So sight, vision, whereas our field of vision is about 190 degrees, that of dogs is 250 to 270 degrees. Dogs have better low light vision than humans because of a special light reflecting layer behind their retinas called the tapetum lucidum. This is something again that we were having a discussion about on Facebook last week. This is a triangle of tissue at the back of the retina, which reflects light back to the retina, so that light hits the retina twice instead of just once, as with human vision. So whereas with us, the light comes in, and that's it. You don't, you don't see it again. With a tapetum lucidum, it comes, bounces back again, so that you get, they get double the amount of light coming in. And the tapetum lucidum is the reason why most dogs' eyes glow green in photos that are taken with a camera flash. The retina then translates light into electrical signals which travel to the brain. Dogs have an area centralis in the retina, so objects in the center of vision are less sharply focused than they would be for us. Because they have fewer retinal cells than us, they may miss objects right in front of them, but can see them clearly when they move away to create distance. The area centralis is less pronounced in long muzzled dogs such as sight hounds. The longer the nose, the better the vision. Um, some dogs don't have um, a very strong area centralis as well, which uh, means that they have a kind of um, more focused vision. But generally, with the long nosed dogs, that's why their vision is better. Vision is focused through movement. A person standing still 300 yards away may be almost invisible to a dog, but a dog can easily identify its owner standing a mile away if the owner's waving his arms. 
the Tapetum lucidum. This accounts for the brightness of a dog's eye reflection when light shone on the eyes, and there may be variations of yellow, green, blue, or orange. Dogs with a small or no tapetum may lack effective night vision. The red glow instead of green when a camera flash is used is similar to how our human eyes look in flash photos. So you can see this is with this dog with the tapetum lucidum, this one with the red glow is without. So it's very likely that their night vision isn't as powerful if they don't have the tapetum lucidum. Colour. A dog's vision of colour is like that of a partially colourblind person. They see blues and yellows, green being a mix of blue and yellow. So a red ball on grass looks like grey on grey. Day glow yellow understandably gets a reaction. But interestingly, the most popular colour bought for dog toys, and things like coats and harnesses as well, is red. Yet it's very hard for a dog to find a red ball on grass. So that's well worth bearing in mind if, if you're using anything red. And you can see from the chart um, the colour differentiations between what we see and what a dog sees. Now, I haven't tried doing a video on here before, but this is a really, really good little three-minute video. Um, Karen's asked here, Lisa, your comment regarding a dog not necessarily being able to see someone 300 yards away. Um, is that why some dogs will charge at people and or dogs in the distance? Yes, it's very likely, Karen, especially if they're moving. Yes, that's what, that's what I was thinking, because sometimes, you know, people appear out of nowhere when your dogs are off lead, and, and sometimes our dogs will charge, you know, just charge ahead, not not to do anything, but just because they didn't see them, and I wondered if that was, that could be the reason why, because they just don't see them. Yes, yeah. Until they move. Yeah, that's right. Hmm, okay, um, thank you. Lynn said, says that she saw somewhere recently that Blue Toy blue toys are the best for dogs to see yes it's true and you'll you'll find this little very short video very interesting um let's click it try and get it moving come on this is where i hope it's going to work aha here we go hopefully you'll be able to hear this okay Sorry, did you say you can't hear it? I think probably what it is is because I've got headphones on. Sorry, folks. What I will do is unplug my headphones and put it back to the beginning, and then you should be able to hear it. I didn't think of that. Hold on. Okay. Hey, guys. My name is Dale, and welcome to a special Monday collaboration video made possible with the help of the So. Let's learn something. Now, dogs have been credited for being man's best friend. And even though we're not all dog people, and women can have dogs as best friends too, scientifically speaking, dogs are quite interesting. When it comes to the vision that dogs have, most people have the misconception that dogs can only see in black and white. And other than that, most people are left in the dark about what kind of vision dogs actually have. <laughs> you see what I did there, Blood Around? You, you learn from the best. Now, vision in most organisms is made possible through the teamwork of combs, rods, and gang lion cells. Rods themselves are in charge of being able to register light and dark, while combs are able to register color and being able to perceive it. Now, for comparative purposes, if the human eye has about 6 million cone receptors concentrated in a little index known as the fovea, around the fovea, the human eye has about 120 million rod receptors. And if you know numbers, that, that's quite a difference. 
On the other hand, dogs have only 1 billion 200,000 color receptors in the back of their eye, which is about 20% that of what humans have, and they also have hypophobia. But dogs do have more rosters in their eyes than humans do, and even though it's hard to get an exact number of how many they have exactly, we do know that their eyes are five times more sensitive to light than that of humans. When it comes to color vision, the average human has trichromacy unless they're colorblind. This means we have color receptors within our eyes that are able to receive one of three colors, red, green, or blue. Trichromacy gives us the ability to see about one million different shades of colors, in contrast to a dog's color vision. Dogs have dichromacy, meaning they only have color receptors that are able to pick up two different colors, blue and yellow. This means that dogs and any other animal that has dichromacy can only perceive about 10,000 different colors. This is why when you go to competitions and involve dogs, the obstacles tend to be blue and yellow colors. Interestingly enough, though, dogs do not perceive the color red at all. But the most popular color for dog toys is, guess it, red. So it's actually a better idea to buy dogs blue and yellow toys because they have a hard time being able to identify red objects anywhere near green things like grass, for instance. But even though that's a bit of a disadvantage, dogs do have some advantages over humans, such as their field of vision. Most dog breeds have about 250 degrees of vision, in contrast to humans who only have about 190 degrees of vision. And not only do they have the capability to see more, but they also have better night vision. This is due to a combination of having more rods than humans, having larger pupils than us, as well as having a tatum. The tatum acts like a mirror within the dog's eye, so once light enters the eye, it reflects back and forth and back and forth, giving the eye more of ability to absorb photons and in turn being able to see things in the dark. This also gives them shiny eyes when you take pictures of them, and the increased amount of rods also gives them better motion detection than humans. But probably the best thing going for humans is that we on average can see further than dogs. The average human has 20-20 vision, and the average dog has 20-80 vision. This means that a dog would have to be 20 feet away from something to see it just as clearly as we could 80 feet away. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is today's collaboration video. My question for you guys is, is if you could trade your vision for a dog's vision, would you? And or, do you know how good your vision is? Mine's 2015, so if you can beat that, good on ya. And with all that said and done, my name's Dale, this is Think Fact and Featherhomes, and remember, never stop learning. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. There you go. Hopefully you all heard it this time. And uh, I have plugged my headset back in, so I'll have to remember. Great. Oh, thank you, Debs. Um, I have to remember to just unplug that with the next video that I have. Okay, so hearing is the next sense. A dog's sense of hearing is far more acute than a human's. Our auditory range um, is from around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The auditory range of dogs is up to 45 kilohertz in the ultrasonic range. So dogs can hear electric um, electric wires buzzing in walls, the ultrasonic squeaks of rats, the movement of ants and termites, and the dog whistle that's inaudible to us. Of course, there's lots of other things that they can hear that we can't. Um, yeah, what I'll do is I'll put the... Um, Linda said that she couldn't hear all of it terribly clearly from the video, so I'll um, share the link with everybody afterwards. Um, so, yep, dogs make association with pitch. They understand a raised pitch at the end of a sentence as a question. If you look at your dog when you raise your voice at the end of a sentence, when you lift it, as if you're asking a question, their ears will prick up. They very often will turn their heads from side to side trying to figure out what you're saying, what you're asking. <laughs> yes, Theo. Uh, they listen carefully to our tones of voice to decipher our emotional states. So the, mecha the mecha blah, blah, blah. mechanics of hearing, when I get my tongue back in the right place, the outer ear is called the pinna, and dogs have different shaped pinnae, from the pricked up ears of Jack Russell Terriers to the long droopy ears of Basset Hounds. The pinnae swivel. Uh, <laughs> As a brummy, I talk like that all the time. The pinna swivel when a dog hears a sound, enabling easy access to the inner ear. The tympanic membrane separates the outer 
and middle ear and then the delicate inner ear connects to the brain and contains nerves for hearing and balance. There was a very interesting experiment done end of last year, November 26, it was published in Current Biology about the differentiation of speech interpretation. Um, the results of a recent study with 250 dogs at the University of Sussex were published online in the November 26, 2014 edition of Current Biology. These indicate that dogs pay attention to the meanings of our words and that they process that information in a different part of the brain from where they process emotional cues in speech. What happened was they had speakers set on either side of the dogs um, so that there was a speaker angled at each ear. And then they used sentences, commands, cues, meaningful words. Um, but then they used an emotional tone of voice for some of them. Um, to add more meaning to them. For others, they garbled them almost like gobbledygook so that they weren't really distinguishable as recognizable words. And they found that when the dogs heard commands that contained meaningful words, about 80% of the dogs turned to the right. When they heard commands with just emotional cues, most dogs turned to the left. So among other things that came up with that experiment, the results show that dogs are able to differentiate between meaningful and meaningless sound sequences. They also demonstrate that a dog's brain breaks up speech into two parts, emotional cues and word meanings. The brain then processes these two elements on different sides, emotional cues on the right, the meaning of words on the left. So that's the opposite to the direction the dogs turn their heads in to listen and in a very similar way to how humans process speech. And then a joke from the Beatles, um, following a day in life on the Sgt. Pepper album is a high frequency 15 kilohertz tone and some randomly spliced Beatles studio chatter. The frequency of the tone is similar to that of a dog whistle intended for dog ears only. And apparently Paul McCartney joked when they put out the album that he just had this image of all of these dogs barking or howling at the end of that particular track and the owners not understanding why because they wouldn't be able to hear the tones. Taste, gustatory. The sense of smell and the sense of taste are interconnected so you'd expect dogs to have a superior sense of taste but a dog only has 1,700 taste buds, whereas we have 9,000, so we have far more refined sense of taste. Dogs can detect sweet, salty, sour and bitter taste, but not the subtle taste differences in the way that humans can. Interestingly, they've got less receptors for salty. <coughs> they perceive sweetness slightly differently to us as they have less salt receptors. Um, because the amount of salt receptors on the tongue also affects the way that you taste sweetness. Um, and they have a proliferation of sweet receptors on the tongue. These are particularly amplified by fructose and sucrose, most likely to enable them to discriminate between ripe and underripe fruit. Karen has just said that Dylan howls at a particular song every time he hears it. Would that then be because he hears that high-pitched sound that humans can't hear? Yes, or, or maybe there's a note in there that just sparks him off. There's Charlie howls whenever the prince is running for some reason. That isn't particularly high-pitched sound, but there must be something in, um, within the sound that it makes that really sparks him off and he actually does it as if he's enjoying it you know he's he's singing <laughs> Karen says it's a Justin Timberlake song which is even funnier oh brilliant yeah it's fascinating there's, there's been a lovely little video going around um, Facebook recently of um, a puppy in a car that is fast asleep until um, a song from Frozen comes on the radio and he immediately wakes up and starts to sing along and as soon as the song ends the dog goes back to sleep again. So there must be certain notes that really spark them off you know, and either make them want to join in or make them want to um, 
just go, actually, I really don't like this noise. And you can tell whether they're doing it because they're enjoying it or because they actually find it quite distressing. Um, I know that with Charlie, initially with the printer, he was terrified of it because he was terrified of everything and it was a completely alien sound. But then he got into this habit where um, he, he just enjoys singing when the printer's on. It's very bizarre. And I've actually videoed it and put it on YouTube. I think I've shared it on, I have shared it on the group page. It's, um, Linda says I had a spaniel that sang to the Coronation Street theme and nothing else. It's brilliant, isn't it? The things that particular dogs seem to key into. And, and I have read that they are doing it purely, most of the time they're purely doing it to join in. You know, if you look at their expressions, they're not stressed. They're, um, just singing along basically. Sarah says Kerno howls when he has the squeaky toy. So yeah, all different things set them off. It's fascinating. Um, how dogs drink. Here's another little video. So I'll unplug my um, headset so you can watch. It's actually, there's not really, actually there isn't any sound in it so I don't need to. It's just fascinating to see how the tongue works. You've probably all seen um, from The Secret Life of Dogs, they showed a clip of a German Shepherd drinking. Um, this is a different clip, but it actually gives a wonderful view of um, how the tongue is used to scoop up water. This is water terrier. I just find it fascinating that they curl it right over to create a scoop that goes in from underneath. Yeah. As June says, no wonder they make such a mess. Yeah, because it goes all over the place. I, yeah, as Karen said, amazing. I, I always find it absolutely fascinating to watch when you see it in slow motion, as Sarah just said as well. And there he goes. <laughs> Oops. Touch, tactile perception. Positive physical contact is vital from birth onwards for any creature to thrive. This doesn't matter what species it is, you know, whether it's a human baby or a puppy or a kitten. Um, it's very important that we get the physical contact in a very positive way. It's obviously you've got the association with warmth that is... Um, that keeps us alive when we're tiny, but there's also that sense of comfort as well, of snuggling up to the litter mates, to the mother. Our bodies contain a somatic map with varying sensitivities in particular areas of the body. A dog's somatic map is different to ours, and one area containing a proliferation of nerve endings is the front of the chest, which is an area that dogs can't access themselves, and they really enjoy being stroked there. It's also a good place to stroke a dog that you're just getting to know as well, because it's not an intimidating area, and it's very pleasant for the dog. Um, each dog has different areas and levels of sensitivities, very much like us, really. Um, so. With some dogs, they really like being stroked gently. With other dogs, they hardly feel it when you stroke them gently, and they want to be stroked a bit more um, firmly. Um, some dogs like to be patted on the bum or whatever. Other dogs find that really offensive and upsetting and scary. 
um, it's an intrusion on them and it's uncomfortable. And, um, <laughs> the motorbike spot, Ali says. Well, it's different in all dogs, obviously, but I would say in most dogs, the front area is, is the most comfortable. Um, usually the sides but it's very interesting when you get a group of dogs together to see where particular dogs like to be touched where they invite touch and where they turn their heads away or go to move away if you go to touch them in a particular area um, the tactile vibrissae the whiskers on a dog's face are extremely sensitive stiff hairs above each eye on the cheeks the upper lips and chin each of these corresponds to a specific area of the brain they help dogs to map their surroundings and to navigate in dim light and confined environments and puppies use the tactile vibrissae to seek out the mother before their eyes open they also contribute to the facial expressions that other dogs can interpret and that we can interpret as well particularly dogs where you can actually see the eyebrows and there are sensory nerves in dog hair each hair on a dog's body has a sensitive me mechanoreceptor nerve at the base so a dog experiences the sensation of touch before direct skin contact is made um, so if you're even just making contact with the very edge of the fur, you know, if you've got your hand almost just above the dog's body, the dog will sense that um, all the way through the skin. It goes straight through to the brain. Susan says, um, I saw a nervous spaniel yesterday and she came back for slow touches on her chest, chilled out and then fell asleep. Just shows you, oh, that's really lovely. Most dogs love it in that area, but that's, it's so special when a dog is very nervous about being touched and then invites it. So with the sensory nerves, the nose pad has high concentrations of sensory nerves like those at the base of the tactile vibrissae. And the pads of the feet have sensory nerves that respond to vibration. Um, I suppose initially dogs would have used this to detect um, early warnings of um, earthquakes but also if there was anything heavy approaching um, they would feel that through the pads of the paws um, before anything got close enough to be a problem Lynn says slow touch on the chest Linda sorry um, says slow touch on the chest is a real confidence building touch especially for anxious dogs um, and Linda practices Tellington touch it is it's wonderful and Ali says that explains how static can affect dogs, perhaps. Well, yes, um, because that affects your head. It's probably one of the reasons why a lot of dogs are so uncomfortable during storms, even before we hear the thunder and see the lightning, the static in the air increases. And um, they pick that up because it makes your hair stand on end if they're static and to them all of the sensory nerves are being stimulated all the mechanoreceptor nerves um, are being stimulated around static I remember seeing um, a video that some or oh, a lot of people were posting on Facebook at the time I didn't share it but um, of this little dog that they rubbed this dear little dog with a jumper and all its hair stood on end and everybody thought it was hilarious and it just seemed really sad to me this, they had no idea that that dog was probably extremely uncomfortable having that done to him or her and finally sensory stimulation or well, coming up to finally uh, remember that overstimulation is as damaging as understimulation. Sensory overload causes a great deal of stress and can be a cause for reactivity. So constant loud music, road drills, chemical air fresheners, which unfortunately a lot of people use those, are just some of the stresses. But of course, there's a lot of other stresses involved. Um, some that we may not even be aware of if it sounds that are um, out of the pitch that we can hear, out of our hearing range. Uh, considering the impact of the environment on a dog's senses should be a vital component of assessment when working with dogs and their carers. 
It's important that dogs are given plenty of opportunities to experience the environment through their senses in a manner that is healthy for them. This can be helpful when working with dogs who are traumatised or who have behaviour issues. And the Snuffle Garden project encourages the creation of sensory areas for dogs. Debbie says here, I found if you offer your dog something new um, and check out their whiskers as they're investigating it, their whiskers curl forward towards the object. Yes, yeah, isn't it fascinating? And finally, a good dig engages all the senses. They can see it, smell it, feel it, hear the sounds that it's making, the earth's making as they're digging. Um, so that's a great thing to have in the garden. And those of you who visited my house will know all about Charlie's dens in the middle of my lawn. He loves nothing more than to dig. Um, and uh, it's, it's fantastic for them. So I will hand you over to Lizzie in a minute. I'll change presenter, make sure that Lizzie's microphone is switched on. Um, where are we? Oh, Liz has self-muted it. So if you want to turn on your microphone, Liz. That's right. it. Great. Lovely. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll click to change presenter um, and make you the presenter. OK? And then you can okay. just hand it back to me afterwards. So there we are. And it's up to you if you want to show your screen or not. Oh, I don't think you'd want to <laughs> be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something that's just popped up on here, my screen. Do, do you want me to, it says, when ready, show my screen. I don't need to do that then. No, no, you, you, no you don't need to show your screen. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, basically, a long time ago, um, when I moved in with my partner, he had a dog, um, um, a working sheepdog, Border Collie, um, who he'd had from a puppy. Now, when I met her, I realised how nervous she was, and I started taking her to work with me, because I was hairdressing at the time. And um, at my the place where I worked, at my father's house, there was wooden floors, and she just could not bring herself to walk through the house to the flat where I worked. And the terror on her face um, to actually come through with me. And so very mindfully, I, I got all these little mats from doormats and so on to put across this rather large space of wooden floor in order for her to cope. And I was so fascinated by how, um, how sad this situation had become, considering that she actually was a very much loved um, pet dog. So from that moment onwards, I'm talking about 18 years ago, I've been absolutely fascinated by making sure that any dog that comes into my care gets the best start possible. I've always gone down the rescue route, never had the, I've had two or three pu puppies from baby, baby puppies, and done my best and utmost to make sure that they get what they need. So since we've been at this property where I keep horses and it's a, yes, there's lots of things lying around, I decided to create um, um, an area where I could work with any dogs that come my way. And these might, it might not be tidy, and I do put a lot of the stuff away, so it's not something that's out all the time. And we can work indoors and outdoors. So when a lot of the dogs that come here, they're often um, rescue dogs. And since we've been in Devon, I've been quite shocked as to how general people are about the way um, they bring their dog up. It's they all seem to be so many are born in sheds; they never get a chance to see daylight, even some of them before they're given to their new families. And I found this so sad. And we've had a collie come our way since then, and he was living in a shed for four years, um, and gunshots and things like that really get to him. So I have worked with him for a long time and decided that I would put a few things together. Here are a few things that I have um, played around with and had fun with and helped a few dogs and also learn about the characters of some of the dogs that I like to um, when I've been doing right with behaviour. Do you want me to put... Oh, yes. you can if you do. Yeah, want me to Liz, put that would you on. like to turn your webcam on? We can see you. 
Oh gosh, I might go shy now. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I'll move back a bit. And um, and so because we've got so many things lying around here, because we've got um, horses and stables, and there's always straw and stuff like that. So what I like to do is to create a really relaxing environment with soft music. Is something that I've always played in the house anyway. Very very soft. Out the brainwave music is what I actually use, and it's just a very calm, peaceful, relaxing music. And I just have it quietly in the background. And I like to watch the dogs explore these various, um, not even obstacles, but um, just general things lying around. And here's some of them, um, contained in a, like a tire space, so like a, a pedal bike kind of tire. You can fill those with sand and gravel and grit um, to keep them all separate, so it's fairly tidy. Um, any old pieces of carpet, um, rubber, doormats, um, I've got a sand pit here, and there's plenty of straw, and using um, touch as possibly um, one of the most obvious things here is very many different surfaces, um, and also allowing the dogs to appreciate that things they touch actually move as well. And so very carefully you can go around these um, these various things and see the response of the dog and allow them to um, to, to see and feel and, and sniff and, and see that these things are, are harmless and that they're everyday things and that you're obviously trusted by them in order for them to um, come to you if there's a problem. And that's what um, that's what I've, I've got here. So we've got some packaging from various things that have been delivered here. Um, so feed sacks, plastic feed sacks, tarpaulin, um, like I say, gravel and grit and, and those sort of things. We've got half round fence posts which we lie flat on the floor. Then it, it's um, something to explore, something to move over. And obviously I don't want to overstimulate any dog or, um, or frighten any dog. And so we wait for them to digest each, each thing. And, um, and see how they respond. And some of the dogs are very level-headed and they will just gently explore things. Other dogs might take a while after their response. They, they go and investigate something extremely wary. And we take it very, very slowly. And uh, once the dog becomes mindful and can relax with all these things, I then take that into consideration during my session with them if we're, we're just doing basic training and so on. And so therefore the, the more, introverts, more introvert dogs, they tend to digest everything really slowly and quietly they, um, they come around and then once they get their confidence up you can move them on to something else. So we do a lot of search games with, um, um, I've got some uh, it's floor matting that you'd use if you're a mechanic. To, to, to stop all the, you know, hard on your knees and so on. Um, yeah, through a dog's ear. I haven't got those, uh, but I've got some of the desensitizing um, CDs and so on, which I sometimes play quietly in the background. Um, but I generally speaking just use the, the quiet music, which is similar. It's very similar because I've listened to some of it and it's brilliant. Um, I should treat myself and get some of those CDs. Um, anyway, that's 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 basically how how I work. And so it, once they get their, their um, confidence up, we've got cardboard boxes for little search games um, and and feeding in all of the situations and keeping them completely in the moment and and totally uh, relaxed whilst they're um, investigating their surroundings. So you've got long grass, short grass. That's always fun because a lot of dogs, to my horror haven't seen um, grass and some of them haven't seen long grass um, and uh, a water games which is just very very quiet nothing um, nothing exciting but a very shallow um, uh, not as deep as a washing up bowl but we've got various horsey bits and pieces lying around and you can actually float um, biscuits and stuff on the top and yeah, massage, ma massage music, Linda, as well. I'm a massive, funnily enough, as well, and I use all those sort of music. It's brilliant. It's really good. It keeps the dogs calm. Um, and um, I, uh, if you bob apple pieces on, on water, the dogs can realize and learn also how to deal with frustration because they realize that water moves. They can bring things towards them. Things move away. Things in there might be worth investigating. And... Um, these are these um, 
uh, are just ideas and sort of silly games that I've been playing over the years with the dogs, my dogs especially. And most of them are pretty level-headed, but um, some of the ones that come here, we thoroughly enjoy. Do I use scent boxes too? Um, I haven't actually, funnily enough. No, I haven't. But we do. We they play search games in in, in the boxes. But we've got um, some plants, uh, some lavender and rosemary and um, jasmine um, to try and you know create a, a more um, sort of a scent type environment as well. Um, I don't know what you would put in um, in your scent boxes. Um, presumably. Um, food smells as, as well as anything else. Who's that? Alice, Ali. Um, what do you put in there? Um, what she got? Is she there? Um, so the, the the dogs, I feel, learn that things move. That they can they can investigate things through their nose, through touch. Um, they can find food and and. Um, touch and feel everything and feel safe. And I remember learning in a course that I did the rule of seven, um, which is feeding your dog in seven different places out of seven different bowls on seven different surfaces, um, taking them to seven different places on um, for seven different days. Um, and it's really um, snowballed in my head how many how many brilliant things we can give our dog. And I feel if I'd have done half of these things, we can. Um, I could have given Zara such a much better life, and it took me a long time to get her to go over wooden floors and stuff. Uh, but she did do agility and so on. Um, the rule of seven. It was brilliant. I, I just. It was the, one of the most um, fun things to work with with the with the puppies on that course. So do I. Yes. It. Um, and I based some of the things on that, and um, and that's what I um, mention to some of my clients when they've got a young dog, and that's their sort of homework for the week. If they're going to come back. Yes, it's um, you'll be surprised, Debbie, how many um, dogs um, that, that and, and as you would know anyway, with, through through working with them, how many dogs won't drink water from a certain off a certain surface, or if you stop at the roadside, you're desperate to give them a drink, and they they can't they can't eat because of this or because of that. Certain essential oils would benefit. We use comfort therapist sensory rooms to save children. Oh wow, that's really interesting. I love all the alternative therapies. I don't know enough about aromatherapy, although I use a little bit when I'm working with massage, um, and, and I do Reiki as well. And that's a completely different subject. But for now, all of these things that I put together um, have helped me no end with with some of the dogs that I've come across. And when the when the more clumsy breeds like Labradors and and Spaniels come to do their search work, they totally engage their whole being to carefully go and find something instead of getting overexcited. And um, the, the 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 most fun one is a, a cockapoo little dog and she was used to be very scared of everything and she so mindfully goes out with these sort of foam sheets and I just rest them up against things, chairs and all sorts of things, anything I can find in the stables I will work with and she so mindfully carefully goes around and she'll retrieve a toy out from underneath something and she'll bring it back to her own and she doesn't knock things over, she's aware that they move, she's not scared and she wags her tail and comes back and she loves things like that um, but it's 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 just I probably spend an awful lot of time on my own and messing around with dogs, so perhaps I have time to, to, to dream up silly games. But I hope that some of these things um, can, can give you some ideas. Um, I, it, the list isn't endless, because if you came here, you'd see, you'd see how I rate. But anything that comes in on the yard is usable and does get used. And shiny packaging um, that I had, I put on the floor. And it looks, if you fold it up into a small square, um, and it, it's about three meters square perhaps, I fold it up into a small square and let the dog interrupt it. And then I unfold it and make it gradually bigger. And the approach and retreat um, uh, behavior of the dog is how I've worked with naturally with horses for years and years. And um, a lot of the work I do with the horses comes very much into, um, thank you, Susan. 
comes very much into into my um, work with, with with the dogs and and my own sort of rehab kind of uh, dogs. But um, unfolding it gradually, letting them approach retreat, getting them more confident, a little feed every time that they've approached, and, and rewarding them every time that they've made a positive effort um, excites me a lot. And to see the confidence in some of the dogs that started nervy and are now happy is just, it just moves the earth for me when I watch it. I'm fascinated and it's brilliant fun. But anyway, that, and skateboards, uh, it's endless. So um, tell me to shut up and I'll go away. <laughs> But um, I hope I've helped a little bit. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Liz. It's really fascinating, isn't it, what, what you can do. And as Sarah said, you should take some videos to show us. That would be really lovely. Well, I've got a few, but I'm not very, I'm not very handy on the computer and the, the delivering stuff on Facebook. I can't even do a new paragraph without accidentally posting my... Um, I accidentally posting my um, post before I was ready to. to do, I mean, I need, I need a child to come round and help me on yeah. that, but I have to go and find one. Yeah, but, um, it's find, not exhaustive. Find, find a child Sorry. and help and put some videos on. So, so there was um, Majoram, Chamomile, um, Neroli. Um, those are all sort of not Neroli, but the other the other two are all things that are lying around outside and are free for sniffing. Uh, but it's a very interesting place we live in as far as a dog's concerned. Oh, it sounds <laughs> fabulous. Tracy says she's just putting together a portable sensory area for her puppy classes. We were oh, talking about this this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, you've given her a few more ideas. I know I've, you've seen my garden. It's not very big, and I was telling Tracy about it this afternoon. I've got this little raised area um, a little herb patch in the garden that has always been the sensory area for the dogs who've come to me. There's been lots of different herbs in there and and they've all absolutely loved it and particularly the very sick dogs um, like Shep, you know, my lovely old 15-year-old um, foster boy who was terminally ill and uh, and he used to just lie in the herb garden with his nose buried in the lavender or the mint and um, the rosemary and just absolutely loved it. They do get so much out of it, you know, and to be able to do what you're doing and create all these different tools that they can just play with, really, that stimulate all the senses, it's absolutely wonderful. You've given us lots more ideas as well, so thank you, Liz. I've got a sand, I've got a sand pit and um, I've got a lovely pitch and I will post that because it's just a photograph, but one of my dogs was in there uh, giving confidence to a little, um, it, I say little puppy, it was a lurch with very long legs, but she she popped into the sand pit and my dog was in there to say, well, this is how you do it. And she's like, really? Wow, bring it on. And she was in the corner as if so I'm sure I know there's something in here. And she was absolutely loving it. And her little sleepy face as she looked out the window when my friend drove her home. It was just lovely. It was so oh. nice. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah, Lynn says, um, the zoo... What sort of sand do you use? Play sand rather than builders. And she also says zoo pharmacognosy is another fascinating subject, which it most certainly is. Yeah. Um, I use, um, um, it, it, it's not a builder sand, it's silver and it's quite gritty. So it drops out of the dog's hair. It doesn't get stuck in the coat. And so it makes um, like a, it makes a sound when, when, when it's kicked up against the boards that surround it. Again, I'll post a photo. Um, and I found it at a local sort of uh, builder's yard, but it's not something a builder would use as much as um, the, the, the usual building stuff. It's it's silver in colour and looks a bit gritty. I'll show it to you. Fabulous. Karen says, Linda, can my lab Purdy come round in your sand pit, please? We're running out of plant pots to put holes in in the garden. <laughs> And Linda says, I helped a client with four very old sick whippets put a herb wild flower garden all around her perimeter fence so the dogs could benefit every day when they went out to do a perimeter based around the Bath Cats and Dogs Home sensory study suite. Oh, lovely. Yeah, they, the Bath Cats and Dogs Home have got um, a fantastic sensory area. Not that far from me. I think we, we'll all going to want to bring our dogs around to you actually <laughs> to have a play oh, I mean, I've just been 
surprised when I look after some people's dogs at what few experiences they get when they live in a town um, or or somebody has a nine to five and the dogs actually get their statutory walk and don't get to experience an awful lot. Mm. So sad. So yeah. I get great boy. <laughs> yeah. Doing these oh, it's lovely. And to see how much they all enjoy it. Linda says, well, we'll turn our gardens over to the dogs. Yeah, I've, I've done that with mine, basically, especially with um, Charlie and his dens. <laughs> Tracy says, I have a few tires that I'm going to use for a snuffle garden. Quite useful if you only have a small garden. Fabulous. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Thank you ever so much, Liz. I'll, I'll write a list and post it. Cause, oh, yes, um, please. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> Okay. Fabulous. So if you want to just change presenter back to me um, mm -hmm. on your thing, you just, on your control panel, you'll see a blue button on the right hand side at the top that says oh, yeah. change Sorry, presenter. Right so done. Then, yeah. You just click that and then scroll down to my name and click on my name. Um, okay. So oh, yeah, I've been back. Done. I'm back now. It? So, um, oh, what am I doing? Can't see where anything is. Okay. Um, okay, I'll share my webcam again just for a minute. Um, brilliant. So, how do you all feel about it? You know, how, how do you feel about the um, the census presentation and um, about what Lizzie's shared about her wonderful sensory area? Um, if you found it useful. Uh, Alice is very thought provoking. Deb says love it, always learning. Linda says excellent, thank you. Natalie says great as always, thank you. Karen says I agree, Deb. And June, fascinating, yes, very useful, thank you both. Natalie, thank you. Theo, excellent. I want to know more about the rule of seven. Already posted on Facebook about that. <laughs> wow, brilliant, Theo. And Lynn says, very interesting. So many ideas to go and act upon. Janet says, very useful, very interesting. Liz says, I'll write a list and post it soon. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Liz. And Tracy says, extremely useful. Love it. And Sarah says, very. And thinking now of how to make the garden more interesting. I think we're all going to be doing that, aren't we? Um, Jessica says, fantastic. Really interesting. Susan says, very interesting. Yes, really enjoyed it. Love to see dogs using their senses. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It also, um, it, thinking a lot about dog senses, which we do as we work with them and spend our lives with them, um, it kind of, it always, always makes me think about the human senses as well and how, you know, ours aren't, many of ours aren't as acute. Um, but how much actual sensory stimulation do we give ourselves and do we, overstimulate some senses and understimulate others, you know, it's kind of worth looking at from a human point of view as well as a dog point of view. Sarah says, you don't think about simple things that help them. It's true, you know, some of the ideas that um, Liz has told us about are things that we might not have thought of. It's great, isn't it? So it will be interesting if you, if you, Lynn says we tend to overcomplicate, overthink things. Yes, we certainly do. Um, so if you do anything, if you if you try any new sensory ideas with your dogs, do post about them on the Facebook group. And um, yeah, I like the idea of the apple in the water. Susan's going to do that at the country club soon. Um, but yeah, post about it. And if you've got photos that you want to share, then share those on the group as well because it's really helpful for everybody and it's really fun to be able to share it and to be able to see how people's dogs are reacting to particular things. Um, Ali says people who don't get touched often tend to be really emotional when massaged. I wonder if dogs are too. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um,
Caroline says, I'm not sure if Lisa's mentioned it. Unfortunately, I had to miss the middle part of the talk. We're very lucky in Bath to have a gardener who designs gardens that are functional and pretty for humans, but also provide enrichment for dogs. Yes, um, I, I didn't mention it, Caroline. And um, it's interesting because he sent me a friend request last week and I was looking at his page and it just I just absolutely love what he's doing. Uh, kind of dog and human oriented gardens dog friendly gardens um, Karen says one of her one of our labs didn't use her nose at all when we first got her which was at five months old I was so surprised at this but it now makes a little more sense following your presentation we took her out over the forest to the beach road walks etc and she's now the one who tracks and finds her ball even when she's lost it on the walk it's fascinating how far she's come along and they said wow what a fab idea yeah Yes, I want to get to know this guy who um, does the gardens, the dog-oriented gardens as well as people-oriented because I think that would be something absolutely wonderful to have. Tracy says, just making a snuffle mat, we'll, we'll post pics when it's done. Fabulous, that would be great. And uh, like I said earlier, it's, that's one of the things that's on my list to make, on my long list of to-do things. Brilliant. Lynn says, well done, Tracy. What are you using for the fabric? Um, I have the mats. If you want to turn your microphones on, actually, I've, I can do it from here with some of them. Um, you're very welcome to actually speak. There's a few of you are self-muted, um, but the, one, the people who I've, I muted earlier, I can unmute so that if you want to speak, you can and be heard. There we go. Um, there. Then it saves you kind of. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh. Sorry, something's making a big noise. Ah. Okay. Let's see if I can pinpoint which one that is. Oh, we're getting lots of background noise with just one, and I can't pinpoint who it is. No. Oh, and then mind. No. I should just. Mute the other microphones a minute then, because there's too much noise interference going on. Um, and uh, oops, quite a few of us here this evening. There we go. Um, that was Tracy's. Um, There we go. Just scrolling through because I've um, lost where, the, where it all is. Okay. Um, Linda says she's going to have to go. Trouble brewing with the furry ones. So thank you very much for coming, Linda. I hope it all calms down this evening. It's brilliant that you managed to get online with all the problems that you're having with internet at the moment, with reception. So thanks for coming. Really glad that you managed to join us. And Natalie says dinner's ready. So we're going to wrap up now anyway. It's just gone 8 o'clock. Um, really lovely to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming. And, um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been lovely to connect up with all of you. And uh, I shall see you on Facebook. Oh, and the next meeting will be... Um, I'll post it on Facebook, but it'll be on the 8th of February. And, um, and I was talking to Dale McClelland earlier, who is one of our affiliates, um, who runs b and Canine in Scotland, in Ayrshire. And, um, and Dale is going to um, talk to you about setting up your own business, about how she set up b and Canine and how she made it successful. So that will be very useful for everybody.
Okay, and thank you everyone. Oh, what a brilliant place the ISCP is. Um, Theo says, ah, oh, Ch Chirag Patel, chicken camp. But, um, okay, well, we can sort it out on Facebook. And I shall look forward to seeing you on there. And take care. I'll put this recording on there once I've managed to transpose it, which always takes a while. Take care. Have a good night. And thank you for coming. It's been brilliant to have you all here. Bye then.